Hello, everyone! So in part one, we discussed the various ways the others might get past the wall in the books, since the show version is pretty unlikely. What else is highly unlikely to be carried over from the show is the manner in which they were dealt with. Even if we want to give D&D some credit and suggest they were told this is how it goes down by George, and they did the best they could with the budget they had, it sure ain't going down that way now after the backlash. This, combined with the conversation from our members in our Discord server, link in the description, got us thinking. How will the others be dealt with in the books? George has been building this threat up for such a long time that to pay it off with what is essentially a rug pull deus ex machina ninja attack would likely be the greatest middle finger given to readers in the history of storytelling. Before we start, don't forget to like and subscribe, and here's our Patreon. Tom has refused to get down on his knees and beg like I ordered him to, so I guess I've got to do it. Let me just prepare my begging voice. Please, please, it would mean so much for us to have your support. Enough people chip in a dollar a month means longer videos, custom assets, and much, much more. That everything, Tom? Well, let's get on with it, buddy. The initial premise of this video was to try and come up with a single theory for how the conflict with the others may be resolved by piecing together the various bits of the puzzle we have so far. Only, when you actually start digging for information, you find we maybe have about 10 to 20 pieces of a 1,000 piece jigsaw. It's really important to note at this point in the books, there are no precise answers in regards to how the others could be dealt with, besides obviously grabbing a fuck ton of dragon glass, borrowing Danny's dragons, and trying to burn and stab them all to death. Well, I guess they're already dead, but now even deader. The prophecy of Azora High and the prince who was promised is pretty vague and quite messy when it comes to the books, so much so that they might not even be referring to the same person. And as of yet, besides a few offerings of babies, we have absolutely no idea what the others actually want and why they want it. Even the most compelling theories you find are relying on some pretty wild stabs in the dark. So, just to be clear, while it was the original intention, this isn't some tinfoil hat theory where we list the precise details of what we think will happen. The idea has morphed into more of an opinion piece of the three broad resolutions to most conflicts in fiction, where they have merit, where they have flaws, and what that could mean for this story specifically. I'll be honest, this video is the result of sunk cost fallacy. I spent too much time trying to piece something together that I'm getting a video out of this one way or another. The three ways we feel a conflict with the others could be resolved are as follows. An all-out war of survival fought with an it's them or us mentality in which only one side may survive this time to rebuild the broken world. So sort of where the show went. A lasting peace is established through a true unifying moment with the others, a bit like the synthesis ending to Mass Effect. You know, assuming that shit isn't taking place inside Shepard's head. Though, it's probably taking place inside Shepard's head. Or a ceasefire, in which no one becomes besties, but a pact is made between the living and the others, and peace reigns, at least for now, and providing terms are met. Starting with an all-out war of survival. It's highly likely all outcomes regarding the others involve war to some degree. What we're talking about here is war as the resolution to the conflict. No negotiation, no misunderstandings, and no peace. Both sides simply duke it out till the other side is wiped out, culminating in one final climactic battle. Maybe the prince who was promised really is just the guy or gal who gathers and heads the army. So probably John, assuming he gets brought back, or Danny. Maybe Lightbringer is Dawn, or Longclaw, or some other sort. Or maybe it's Danny's dragons. And boy do they bring the light. Maybe the other's means for survival are simply incompatible with the living, and there can be no coexistence or compromise or peaceful resolution. And Bran's part in the whole affair is to look to the past and learn why there is no choice but to stand and fight to the end this time, and where is probably best to do it. Or potentially he uses his forest magic to deliver the coup de grace to the great other, and that's why people crown him king. Perhaps the only way for the living to make it through the conflict really is to arm themselves with dragonglass, borrow Danny's dragons, and through a long, 
bloody and extremely costly war of attrition, take the others down one by one until they are wiped out. Let's start with why this could be a good direction to go in. Well, for one, it's what most fans think they want. A big, epic war where the heroes have to earn their victory through hard-fought sacrifice against these evil, necromancing demons. George is also not a fan of Deus Ex Machina and moments of convenience, and usually goes out of his way to prevent it. He likes circumstances and resolutions to be a result of the consequences of his character's choices. I.e., you don't get a convenient out of a situation just because it's a fictional story. You play a stupid game, you win a stupid prize, regardless of main character status. We've said this before in previous videos, but in A Song of Ice and Fire, if the hero is surrounded in a seemingly hopeless situation, you really should fear turning that page. Something some fans may not know is that when writing The Red Wedding, George actually had to write the Aftermath chapters first to cement it into the story, because as a Gardener-style writer, he couldn't bring himself to kill Rob and Catelyn in that moment. Now, the seeds of The Red Wedding had been planted. There was no way to avoid the event itself taking place, but there were ways to get Rob and Cat out of that situation alive to a Gardener-style writer if their deaths were not cemented in future chapters. A few off-the-cuff examples being... 1. The Great John was present, and let's remember this guy is second in size and strength only to the mountain, and supposedly seven hells of a warrior. Perhaps the phrase underestimate just how formidable he is even when drunk, and perhaps he acquires a weapon and turns the tide in favour of the Northmen, who in the books don't just lay down and die like little bitches, but fight back quite well to say how badly they've been caught with their pants down. 2. Greywind could have broken out of his cage somehow and made it to the hall, but before the ambush begins, tipping the Northmen off that something's up, and like Great John causing enough havoc to give the Northerners a fighting chance. Or three, maybe a decent chunk of the Stark forces outside could have very well overcome the Freys and the Boltons. Something that is often overlooked when we think of ambushes is that they are not in fact a sure thing, even if you catch the targets off guard. And they can, and have, backfired massively in our history. Maybe a good chunk of the Stark forces could have fought their way into the Twins to aid Rob, and the Northerners overpower the forces inside, seize the castle, and take Roos and Walda hostage. Is any of this a good idea? No, not really, and I'm not trying to suggest this would have been better than what George gave us, not by a long shot. But the point is, these factors are plausible enough to escape the realms of pure wish fulfillment, and George could have done something like this to keep characters alive. But he didn't. He went with the most grounded and likely outcome of the situation. I know that was a bit of a tangent regarding a separate event from the books, but it is relevant as to why a war to the death with the others may be the only option. For there to be no magic or convoluted or contrived solutions, or any last second saves due to magic and prophecy, it's simply stand together, fight and live, or bicker, fracture and die, is very in line with the grounded nature of the series. As for why this could be a bad direction to go in? Well, for a start, it's not exactly a closely guarded secret that A Song of Ice and Fire has an anti-war agenda in its narrative. For the greatest existential threat in the series to be resolved with conventional mass violence and two sides trying to genocide one another really does undercut that message. You could salvage this idea though by having the living destroy the others and learn afterwards the others had peaceful intentions or played some key role in the balance of the world, which can maintain the integrity of of the war is bad message. Another point against this idea is that this is what a lot of people think they want. Many fans want the long night we've heard about in the legends. We want a big epic war. But let me ask you this. When the fuck has this man ever given you what you wanted? I know it's a tacky way to phrase it, but the brilliance of George's writing is that he doesn't give the reader what they want, he gives the story what it needs. Which is often a far more complex resolution due to his work taking place in a complex world. There's also the way this resolution kind of frames the others as a relentless evil force to be defeated. Good and evil isn't really a thing in A Song of Ice and Fire. Everything's grey, and for the others to basically just turn out to be pure evil, very much 
diminishes them as a unique entity, making them no different from the armies of Mordor in Tolkien's works. Again though, you could work around this by having the rug pull of the others having peaceful intentions all along once they've been wiped out. But if we had to pick the biggest gripe with this resolution, it would have to be the prophecy. Now, we very often make comments in our videos stating John is obviously Azora High, but sometimes I think our viewers don't realize we're only poking fun at the show, which, no matter how you slice it, hard set up John as Azora High slash the prince who was promised. And while you can do some mental gymnastics to make it sort of fit still by saying John did rally the army that fought the others and are your major just be the Lightbringer, it did not pay off in a satisfying way. But where the books are concerned is a different kettle of fish. George has made two things clear about prophecy in the world of ice and fire. Number one, prophecy can be total bullshit. Number two, even when it's not total bullshit, it should never be taken literally and will usually resolve in an unconventional or unexpected way. This alone is almost enough to dismiss the idea that conflict will resolve with an all-out war where the leader of the living wields a magic sword and smites the others to bring in the dawn. It's just a far too literal interpretation of the prophecy. As for how we feel about this idea personally over here at the Fandom, as much as the generic fantasy fan inside me would love the big, epic battles, and I'm a sucker for the good versus evil narrative, I know in my heart that the world of Ice and Fire doesn't play that shit, and I just can't see George going with the literal interpretation of the prophecy. George has also stated he's looking for a bittersweet ending. For the story to end in genocide of one side would mean one of two things the others were evil, or the living were the real baddies all along. One diminishes one side to cookie-cutter villains, the other is paradoxical to a bittersweet ending, in our opinion at least. The baddies won? What the fuck? Both just clash with the anti-war and morally complex narrative too much for us here at the Fandome. Moving on to the next potential resolution to the conflict. Everlasting Peace. The Living and the others both see that fighting is pointless, likely with influence from Bran so we can justify his kingship once again, and both sides make a permanent, everlasting peace agreement. Yeah, we may as well just skip to our thoughts on this idea. Look, we tried to build a case for this, honestly we did, but it's just too cutesy and too much out of a fairy tale in our opinion for the conflict with the others to end in everlasting peace, where both sides just agree to stop fighting because of misunderstandings and some epic unifying moment bringing everyone together. It really doesn't fit with the tone of the world of ice and fire. It's too much sweet and not enough bitter in our opinion too. A bittersweet ending usually signifies that the world cannot go back to the way it was due to the impact of narrative events. Which, if the others simply agree to go back to the lands of always winter, and the living agree to stay south of the wall, and that's it, nothing else, just peace, is exactly what would be happening. Look at nearly, I'm stressing the word nearly that guy, every instance peace has been achieved in the world of ice and fire without one side violently destroying the other. It isn't built on the fairy tale idea of, and they lived happily ever after. It's built on the real world notion that everyone deserves a second chance to do the right thing. Or, if you want to be a bit more realistic, everyone deserves a second chance to listen to the guy with the biggest stick. Which leads us perfectly to the final possible broad resolution, and that is Ceasefire. So, not a fairy tale ending, but after a long period of war, a fragile peace with ongoing terms of some kind is reached. Perhaps Bran learns to communicate with the Great Other and brokers a truce, or maybe he looks to the past and discovers the Others were never beaten back in the first place and the original Long Night ended with a pact, a pact the living have since broken and need to remunerate the Others for. Or perhaps Bran finds out that the Others are themselves struggling to survive and need something only the living possess, and uses that as leverage to hold them in their tracks. Going hard on the Bran stuff here, which I'll address soon. Like we said earlier, it's hard 
highly unlikely the others are analogous to the forces of Mordor and are irredeemably evil, seeking to destroy the living just for the sake of it. There's a really good chance they actually want something beyond death and destruction, and may only be employing force because they've reached a point where they believe there is no other way to get what they need, and the living simply need to show them that what they want can be attained through peaceful means. No true peace and becoming best buddies with this scenario, but an understanding is reached. An understanding that requires concessions on both sides and for both sides to honour their obligations. So why would this be a good direction to go in? Okay, okay, elephant in the room first. Maybe their reanimating of our dead is some kind of cultural misunderstanding. We view this through the eyes of the living, as a gross macabre desecration of a corpse, and in the eyes of some, it could even be considered an insult to puppet the dead. But the others may not see it that way. They may believe that flesh has nothing to do with life, and so once life is gone from its vessel, the flesh is basically a tool that's been discarded that the others don't see any issue recycling. We've got to devil's advocate this somehow, because it's the main factor that paints the others as solely evil. There is a lot of corpse desecration in the world of ice and fire performed by the living, and not once is it ever construed with anything good and noble. So there may just be a misunderstanding about what is socially acceptable to the living. Fuck it, Tom, this will have to do. The commenters will come up with much better explanations, I'm sure. On to the less shaky positives. This resolution also definitely fits the anti-war agenda a damn sight more than a genocidal war of survival, while still being able to facilitate a brutal exchanging of hostilities that can satiate the hunger for violence that the more bloodthirsty fans have. Also, this type of resolution really opens the door for Bran to be the linchpin player of the conflict and really earn his kingship. It's been established the others don't speak our language, with their own tongue being likened to the sound of cracking ice. So to communicate with them comprehensively enough beyond primitive universal gestures, in a short enough space of time to resolve a world-ending conflict before it gets out of hand, is likely going to require engagement that steps into the metaphysical. Assuming Bloodraven gets offed like he does in the show, which I think is probable, that would leave Bran as the only Greenseer left who could potentially look into the past and learn how to commune with the icy bastards. I ended an apocalyptic scale war and negotiated a peace agreement with an ancient enemy whom only I have the power to communicate with. I also have wells of knowledge that can prevent this from happening again, you feckless half-wit peasants. Is a much stronger argument for why you should be king over, yo, I've got mad stories me fam. Another point of favour is how grounded this outcome is, which of course fits with the grounded tone of the series. War very often is just two sides kicking the crap out of each other and eventually deciding not to do that anymore, resulting in both sides not actually making friends but coming to a mutually beneficial agreement, though of course whichever side had the least crap kicked out of them will usually benefit the most for obvious reasons. Of course, there are exceptions to this, which is why option 1 should not be discounted, but for the most part, this is how most conflicts end in the real world. Both sides don't end up besties, they just agree not to fight anymore. At least for now. As for why this might not be the way the story goes, well, I can only really think of two aspects that hinder this idea. The first being that, while our interaction with the others has been rather limited in the books, the main takeaways we've had so far seem to be their whites attack to kill on sight, they want our babies, and the longest interaction we've had with these silver-skinned fucks showed them to be a group of sadistic dickholes who seem to be taking genuine pleasure in the suffering of the living. In this case, poor Waymar Royce. But hey, we can't tar the whole race with the same brush due to the actions of a choice few, I suppose. That's Isism, and we don't do that shit over here at the Fando. The second hindrance for us personally would be in what is likely the potential nature of the agreement between the living and the others. 
As alluded to in point one of this section, what we have so far in a pre-wins world in terms of the two instances in which the living have been able to negotiate with the others, we know of only one commodity they seem to be willing to bargain with, and that's newborn babies. If George is shooting for a bittersweet tone in his ending, the continual sacrifice of innocent babies in order to keep the wolf at the door, so to speak, just seems to be leaning a bit too far on the bitter and not enough on the sweet. I know the idea of a bittersweet ending is open to interpretation, but yeah, to me at least, way too dark a direction to go in. How do we feel about this resolution at the Fando? If I had to bet money on the broad outcome, this is where I would put my chips. It just ticks too many boxes and puts all the round pegs into the round holes. It's in keeping with the anti-war narrative, it's an extremely grounded and real way to resolve the conflict, and in our opinion at least, it best facilitates Bran ending up as the one true... Nope, I'm not saying it, Tom, because he's not. Ours is the Fury. Ours is the Fury. Get your hands off me. Ours is the Fury. Ours is the Fury. <laughs> There's also this nice underscoring of peace itself as a concept not being a fixed constant. Peace between enemies is not a stagnant state of being. It must be upheld and must be maintained by all sides. One thing that always bugged George was the ending to the masterpiece, The Return of the King. In the end, Aragorn becomes king and peace reigns, but we never find out how peace is being maintained. What were Aragorn's tax policies? What was his stance on religion and border control, etc, etc? So for George not to have there be some sort of terms in order to uphold the peace with the others would make him a bit of a hypocrite, wouldn't it? A good analogy to this idea is a candle in a dark room. With the darkness representing war, the light representing peace, the wax and the wick representing both factions previously at war respectively, and the fire representing effort. You can't create prolonged light with just the wick, nor can you achieve it with just the wax. You need both. And even with both, you need the energy slash effort of fire to work together with the wick and the wax to create the light. But even when all three elements are working together, eventually the candle burns out and darkness once again takes over unless you light a new candle before the old one burns out. The idea that even once a steady peace is achieved, both sides must make consistent concessions and sacrifices to maintain it just feels very real, and I think that feeds into the bittersweet angle nicely. I even think there's a way for the prophecy to resolve in this scenario thanks to George's known fondness for weasel wording. The prince who was promised is a great example of this. It never actually states who the prince was promised to. Maybe the others needing newborns is a temporary fix, and rather than securing a truce through continuing this horrific practice of human sacrifice, the prince who was promised doesn't actually save the living and deliver them from darkness by destroying the others, but rather by saving them instead. Instead. That seems like the sort of hippie bullshit a draft dodger would go for, eh, George? And that's our take. How do you guys think the conflict with the others will resolve in the books? And what specific details can you cobble together from the darkness that lays ahead? Let us know down below, and thanks for watching, guys.